The comments contained in this podcast do not constitute legal advice. The opinions herein are the opinions of the speakers and not the official opinion of the Hodgson Russ Law Firm. Hey there, tax fans. Welcome to State Tax Talks with me, your host, Joe Tantillo. I'm a tax attorney at the Hodgson Russ Law Firm looking to explore the nuances of state and local tax law. Here on the show, our goal is to keep tax informative, simple, and fun. So if you're ready to talk tax, turn up the volume and dive into this episode of State Tax Talks. We're here today with part two of our conversation with Mr. Joe Endress discussing the topic of sales tax. We've talked about what happens uh, and, and how states can kind of uh, extend their arm and, and pull you into their jurisdiction. But once you're there, what do you need to worry about in terms of what is being taxed? And I'm sure that your answer is going to be, it, it depends. depends. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, again, you have 45 different laws that impose the sales tax in different ways. So generally speaking, again, some patterns emerge and most states tax the sale of tangible personal property. There is a presumption in most states that all sales of tangible property are subject to tax unless a specific exemption apply. Uh, so if that exemption applies, then we'll remove that you know, from the traditional uh, or usual rule of imposing tax. You know, so for example, here in New York, you know, all sales of tangible property are taxable except for those that are exempt. And some of those that are exempt are groceries, right? We don't uh, charge when you go to the grocery store to buy a dozen eggs or you know, a, a loaf of bread or you know, certain medical equipment or certain you know, manufacturing equipment, you know, production materials. There's a whole bunch of exemptions that are applicable to get you outside of that normal rule that if you're selling something tangible, it's taxable. And you just have to know the rules in the state. And that's really just one side of the sales tax, right? That's just for tangible stuff. But what about services, right? Services aren't tangible personal property. You know, do you, does the state tax services? And again, the answer is it depends on the state. Some do, some don't, some tax much fewer services. But the presumption that applies to tangible property does not apply to services. In most states, it's the exact opposite, most states take the position that services are not subject to sales tax unless they're one of the few specifically enumerated in the law that are subject to sales tax. So, you know, again, it's it's tangible property, presumed to be taxable. Then you look to an exemption. Services, at least in New York and many other states, uh, services are not taxable. There's a presumption they're not taxable unless they're one of the few that are specifically listed as taxable. So circling back again to the kind of uh, legal basis of how taxability is determined, it sounds like there's quite a bit of policy considerations in play at the state level um, where these exemptions come in. And, you know, everything starts at uh, the legislature for the most part. But then, of course, there are also local sales taxes that that people have to consider. So um, I, I'm guessing that uh, if you uh, want to have a shot at, at, at making your particular good or service not taxable, you can you can call your, your local assembly person, right? Or your state senator? Sure. I mean, <laughs> there's absolutely lobbying. And look, you know, they're, they're, they're policy decisions for how we apply our sales tax. We may want to foster a specific industry in our state. And one way to help do that is by giving it a tax break. So for example, in, here in New York, if you want to set up a data center to, you know, a high technology business in, in New York, there are exemptions for data center. If you want to, you know, for example, set up a um, software uh, servicing, you want to service software remotely, there's an exemption for um, certain software services. So, you know, you can use these exemptions to target where you want to focus, a, 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 you know, the development of an industry in the state and cut them a break. This is a good point for me to mention that Joe Andrus is also the tax credit expert at Hodgson and Russ and one of the uh, best tax credit uh, attorneys around. Because my next question is, what's the benefit of exempting, you know, a certain good or service or industry from sales tax as opposed to just allowing a credit for for what it is that they're doing in terms of, you know, policy and incentives and growing an industry in a state? Yeah, so th that's a good question. And I, I think that, you know, there is generally speaking more control with respect to a credit because anytime you make a credit a claim, right, you're filing a return that basically says, look, I've done what I said I was going to do. For example, New York State just passed 
the new Chips Act, right? It's a it's a tax credit for manufacturing microchips in New York State. So it got passed to pretty big fanfare, and and there was just a public announcement of a significant deal that's going to happen uh, outside of Syracuse. And so again, we can target the industry that we want to help develop. But as part of this program, you've got to do certain things. You've got to jump through certain hoops in order to be entitled to these tax credits. And the tax credit program, I think, allows for more control over the activity that happens and then more verification that that activity actually did happen before you get the tax credit. If you just issue an exemption, you know, something is not subject to tax, you know, you don't know exactly how many transactions are happening. You don't have the same level of control that you do with someone when they come to claim a credit. Thanks for that answer, Joe. And listeners, if you're interested in learning more about New York's new green chips uh, credit program, uh, Joe and I wrote an article about it entitled New York Goes All In on Chip Manufacturing. You can read it in the Enders Assessment on State Tax Notes, which is available online. Circling back to sales tax, what do we do? How do we approach ambiguity in the sales tax law? Probably one of the most interesting things uh, about sales tax is that it leaves a lot of gray area for some of these goods and services. I mean, what if I'm a business owner who thinks, you know, maybe I don't have to collect sales or charge sales tax on this because it's worded kind of funky. So you said you were kind of geeky uh, with respect to the Marvel reference. Well, I'm going to let my geek flag fly right now and say that this is my, you know, sales tax is my favorite tax for this reason, right? There is a lot of ambiguity in sales tax. And the problem with that ambiguity is that the stakes are so high, right? If I don't properly collect and remit my sales tax, you know, let me take a step back. The sales tax is supposed to be on customers, right? Businesses only become liable for that tax if they fail to collect and remit. And so if I don't collect and remit, I suddenly have a bill. I, the business, suddenly have a bill or a liability that I have to deal with. And so the problem with that is that that's a significant liability. And it comes with penalties and interest. And sales tax is one of the few taxes that actually create personal liability for those people responsible for running the business. In other words, if my business doesn't properly collect sales tax, the tax department isn't limited to looking to the business to pay that liability. Rather, they can go after the individuals and their individual assets with certain limitations in order to satisfy that debt. So, Is it, that regardless of the type of business or the, or the structure of the, of the entity? So S-corps, partnerships, C-corps, you can have personal liability on these sales tax uh, issues? The answer to that is yes. All, all of those uh, owners or, or people responsible for the businesses can have personal liability. There are different rules and different things to think about depending on the different entities. That personal liability works differently depending on the entity. But the answer is yes. All those people can um, have personal liability. But But let me just go back to, again, high stakes, right? Because these people can be looking at personal liability now uh, with respect to these sales tax debts. And it's one thing if the law was crystal clear and I just decided or I, I just said, I'm going to stick my head in the sand and I'm not going to charge sales tax. But the law is not crystal clear. We have these high stakes on one side of the ledger and we have this just really confusing set of rules on the other side. And that makes for a very difficult situation, especially for small mom and pop businesses. Look, you know, when you're dealing with the big companies that have a, a lot of resources that can, you know, put a full accounting department together to deal with these nexus rules and these taxability rules, that's all one thing. But what if you got a mom and pop shop that just have a website that are selling all over the, you know, United States? That's another. You want to start a growing business? Well, you know, the sales tax compliance can be a real burden to that. And so, you know, look, we're sitting in a studio right now, right? We're sitting in a, a recording studio here. And th let's just ask. What Hodgson Ross is buying here, what is it, right? Ooh, that's a good question. Are we buying the studio time? Are we buying the uh, audio editing services that our editor, uh, Jordan, so kindly provides for us? I, I don't know. It's a, it's a little up in the air. Exactly. It, it depends in large part on, you know, the, it, every single sales tax 
matter depends on the specific facts of the case. So are we buying the studio? Are we renting the studio? That's a rental of real property, right? That would not be taxable under the sales tax. But you just tweak those that transaction a little bit and we say, well, wait a minute, we're not buying a studio. We, we couldn't record this ourselves, right? We, we have professionals here helping us with this and, and performing services for us. So is that service subject to tax? And the question, the answer to that could be, again, it depends, right? It, it, you know, what are we getting from this? Are we getting a, a finished, polished podcast? And how is that finished, polished podcast delivered? Is it delivered via disc, you know, some tangible media? Or is it delivered electronically? That, too, can change the taxability of the product. So what are you buying? Physical space? What are you buying? What are you renting? If not physical space, are you renting any of the equipment in the physical space? Are you getting a finished podcast? Is that a tangible thing? Is it, a, is it an intangible digital product? All of those different facts change the taxability of the transaction. And it's that type of confusion that can make a small business's head just spin. It really is a super cool and nuanced area of the law for for exactly that reason and and you know being uh state and local tax attorneys who who handle sales tax cases getting to uh fight about it and, and present our position is 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 just awesome frankly and I'm, I'm 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 quickly becoming a, a a sales tax nerd uh myself so i th- i think this is a good time if you have any favorite stories about you know the gray area in sales tax that you've personally gotten to uh, take a part in, I think this is a great time to share it with the audience. Well, I mean, there are a million of these, you know, just kind of funny little nuances to sales tax. Think about this. Uh, Think about these transactions. If I get my haircut, is that subject to sales tax? Oh, man. Okay. Because I'm thinking about this, like, is the finished product like... (laughs) somehow the new hairstyle that's is that a tangible product because it was transformed or or is it just the service of them you know cutting shampooing washing your hair i i don't know i'm gonna say no i'm gonna say no the answer is it depends (laughs) (laughs) it depends on where you're getting your haircut you know if you're if you're getting your haircut you know up here in in uh, wonderful Buffalo, our hometown, uh, then the answer is no. But you travel down to New York City, our, our adopted hometown, and the answer is yes, you know, because again, the rules are different based on the ge- ge- uh, geographic location where the transaction occurs. Uh, let me ask you another one. It's it's, it's crazy. Um, let's say I'm a homeowner, right? And, and I want to, oh, let me start again. Let's say I'm looking to buy a home. And before I do that, I want to know if this house that I'm considering, if it's worth the price. You know, are there any skeletons in the closet? Is there any, uh, are there any issues with respect to the foundation or, you know, where are the bodies buried? What, what's the story on this house? And so I do a home inspection. As a prospective buyer, I decide to say, hey, I want my professional to come in and tell me if there are any issues with that house. Is that home inspection subject to sales tax? This one's got to be... No, but I probably should say it depends being a, a, a wise attorney, but I'm going to say this one's got to be no. That's correct. That The answer to that is no. But let's change the facts just a little bit. Let's say now instead of a home purchaser, a, pr- a prospective home purchaser, I am the homeowner. And the homeowner, as the homeowner, I decide, well, look, I'm trying to figure out what this house is worth. I got to know if there are any issues with it. I'm going to get the exact same report. I'm going to get someone to come in and do a home inspection. I get the exact same report that that prospective buyer would have gotten. And the question is, is is that taxable? I'm guessing now the answer is yes. (laughs) You got it. (laughs) (laughs) It's taxable now as as maintenance to the real property. It's the first step in, in kind of maintenance. And there's authority out there that says that's taxable. So the exact same product, now depending on the difference in the customer, that changes the taxability of the product. It's it's crazy. It's these type of, you know, silly little nuanced rules that suddenly cause something from being taxable to being non-taxable and vice versa that is very difficult to kind of get right. That is wild. And of course, the tax code is only a brief thousands of pages for those of you out there who are looking to scour it. I mean, no wonder that people get tripped up over this kind of thing all the time. It's, it's wow. It's yeah. all, all I could say is, Wow. Even as someone who you know works in this field. Wow. I think that's a great segue into just the taxability of services in general with 
tangible property. I think the exemptions, there's gray area there. And with the services, as you just alluded to, there may be changes depending on locality or customer. How do you define what you are actually selling and who is it incumbent upon to make that definition? Yeah, that's a great question. And a lot of sales tax audits turn on that exact question. The point here is to have your sales tax position align with how you define the sale for purposes of your marketing material, for purposes of the contracts you enter into with your customers, for purposes of the invoices that you send out to those customers, right? If if I say what I'm selling you is, you know, information, I'm just giving you an information. I want to know, you know, the history of certain stocks in a certain specific uh, industry. Well, if that's what I say I'm selling you in my marketing and in my uh, contracts and in my invoices, but then an audit happens and an auditor comes in and says, well, look, in New York, information is taxable. That's taxable. You should have been charging tax on those transactions. And then I get thinking about it. I go, well, well but wait a minute. What, what, I, what the customer is actually looking for is not just that canned rote information, but rather my service of interpreting that data to pro- provide a blueprint or a game plan of how to m- move with respect to that industry or how to you know, align my marketing strategy, my portfolio. So the question is whether or not the information is what the customer is buying or rather they're buying my expertise to interpret that information. In other words, they want to know, you know how they should proceed with respect to this market or what they can expect in the future and that's my forecasting or they want you know, to my, their portfolio analyzed. And again, that's my expertise. Um, I, we just litigated a case. This is a published decision uh, that's you know, on the New York State Di- Division of Tax Appeals website where we had a, a customer that provided a risk assessment primarily to banks, right? So a bank was thinking of putting a mortgage on a piece of real property or giving a mortgage on a piece of real property. And the vendor here said, well, before the bank agrees to enter into that mortgage, they want to know if that piece of property is a good investment. In other words, is there, you know, uh, oil tanks buried in the back 40 of that property? (laughs) Are there environmental issues with respect to that property? And so what they did is they would hire the vendor to come in and do a risk assessment, right? And as part of that risk assessment, the vendor got all this historic data, just this canned information that uh, related to that site to help make a determination. And as part of the final product that they sent to their customers, the banks, they provided all that data, all that information about the property, but then also provided an assessment, their opinion, their um, conclusions as to whether or not this piece of property was a high risk, low risk, medium risk, et cetera. And so the question was, well, what was the customer buying? Were they buying just that canned information or were they buying um, all the expertise and knowledge that went into making the determination, the recommendation. Similar like with Joe Joe, with us, right? When we put together a memorandum, a customer comes to us and says, hey, Joe, uh, is what I'm selling subject to sales tax? And we put together a detailed memorandum that reviews all of the cases and all of the advisory opinions and all of the, you know, the statutes and, and the regulations. And we come to a conclusion and this thing is a, you know, it's a stack of paper that is a memo on top that is our conclusions and then a whole huge stack of paper behind it uh, on which the, the, you know, the material on which that con- those conclusions are based. Is that taxable? Well, no. You know, this is the, these are legal services and legal services aren't subject to tax. But that's the fundamental question is, are what you buying just the canned information or is it the opinion on which, you know, you can rely to move forward? And so that's, you know, how you define the transaction, what you say about it in your marketing material, what you say about it in your invoices, what you say about it in your contracts. All of that comes into play when you're audited and the auditor's saying, well, we think you're selling something else. You know, at the end of the day, what matters most are the facts on the ground, the facts of the transaction. If all of my invoices, contracts, and marketing material call something a duck – but it barks and wags its tail. I don't care that I called it a duck and all that material. What you're actually buying is a dog, right? <laughs> so that's the most important stuff. But it helps if everything is aligned. It makes the audit experience much smoother. And I imagine there's a similar analysis that happens when people are bundling together both tangible personal property and services, you know, separating out 
those two things, uh, I, I have to guess, can sometimes be difficult. Sure. I mean, it can be difficult even if we just keep it in the the all tangible property world, right? There's a a famous rule kind of in, in New York sales tax circles that, you know, it's called the cheese board rule, right? And, and with respect to that rule, the question is, well, if I buy a piece of cheese, that's generally not taxable, right? Because we said earlier, we don't tax groceries. But what if I buy a, a cutting board, a board to cut that cheese on? Well, that's just tangible personal property, and there's a presumption that that's taxable. There's no exemption that applies to cutting boards. So there you have a taxable cutting board and a non-taxable piece of cheese. Well, what if I take those two things and I package them together for one price? I got a $5 board and a $5 piece of cheese, but rather than charging like that, I just charge for the whole thing for $10. Well, suddenly the taxable cheese board has tainted the non-taxable cheese and cause the entire transaction to be taxable. Now, the, the tax department takes the position that it's not the auditor's job to determine how much of that receipt is cheese and how much of that receipt relates to the board. So you have to be careful when you have bundle, bundled transactions, whether it's all tangible property or property and services, you have to make sure that you are properly treating taxable items as taxable and non-taxable items as non-taxable. The taxable cheese board has tainted the non-taxable cheese is going to be the title of my next album. <laughs> <laughs> I got to get a shirt with that on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Joe, thanks for being here. This is an excellent discussion. We're going to take another pause and we'll pick up this conversation in part three of our introduction to sales tax episode next time. Thanks for joining us for another episode of State Tax Talks. If you're interested in listening to more episodes, we're available on all platforms where podcasts can be found, including YouTube. If you enjoyed this episode of State Tax Talks with Joe Tantillo, please give us a five-star review on your favorite podcast platform. And if you're in need of a tax professional, you can contact the tax attorneys at Hodgson Russ. Go to www.hodgsonruss.com for more information. And until next time, I'm Joe Tantillo, and this is State Tax Talks. Catch you later, tax fans. The comments contained in this podcast do not constitute legal advice. The opinions herein are the opinions of the speakers and not the official opinion of the Hodgson Ross Law Firm.